Let's see. Okay. I think we're good. So this is good. I, uh, I really appreciate that as people are coming in, they're throwing their name up there so that I can take roll. That makes it a lot easier. Um, I did do drops this weekend, but I, I do still have to keep taking roll. Uh, and roll is definitely something that I um, look back on, right? Um, you know, when a, when a student, you know, if there's a close call at the end of the semester on a grade and it's like super close, uh, you know, uh, and I'm trying to decide, hmm, should I just bump this student up to the next grade or should I leave them where they are? Two things I look at, attendance and homework, because attendance and homework tell me this person was really trying. This person was really throwing themselves into the work, was really trying to learn in this class and achieve things. That's the kind of person you want to give a, a tiny bump to. I'm not saying like I'll bump you, you know, a huge percent. But if someone's real, real close, I usually look at homework and attendance and go, that person was really putting the effort in. Maybe they deserve the benefit of the doubt. Um, you know, and of course, I always get requests at the end of the semester. Oh, I can you just bump me up to the next grade, please? And then I look and the person did like 50 percent of the homework or didn't really attend class. Then, you know, why should that person get get uh, extra? Right. If they if they should have worked a little harder. Right. So just keep that in mind. Um, that's that's kind of uh, a thing I look at. So I will I will give people a few more minutes to come in before I take uh, before I write down the role. So I'll wait a few minutes. And we'll kind of introduce stuff while we talk about it. Um, so like I say, census was this weekend. I think I don't know if I dropped anyone in my I can't remember which class I dropped people in, but um, I think one person ended up getting dropped in this class, but it was an obvious case. It was. Um, someone who had never even come to class. So um, that was the only, I think, drop I did in, in here. So uh, most of you who are sh showing up should be fine. Uh, you sh should be good to go. So where are we going from here? So you can see we had a chapter one homework was due, what, late, uh, mid, mid last week, somewhere in there. Uh, that was due. We're now on chapter two, which is due today. Right. Remember, I talked about that at the beginning of the semester. Sometimes there's a quick turnaround, but that's because I gave you kind of extra time for chapter one because people were setting up their homework accounts. And sometimes that takes a week. So I gave you a little bit extra time on chapter two. But then I said, don't wait till the last minute because then you, you have less time to do chapter two. So chapter two is due today. Hopefully you're in the group of students who's already been working on chapter two. So you're not going to be stressed out. Um, some of you have not really done chapter two, so that's, you know, what you're going to spend your day doing uh, for some of you or, or just not getting the points. So we want to be working through chapter two. I will talk a little bit about chapter two and then we will move into chapter three, which, as you can see, not that far off the due date for chapter three. Right. We got to move quick on some of the stuff. The good news is most of the stuff in chapter three is pretty straightforward. Um, students usually pick it up pretty quickly. I don't see a ton of people you know really getting stressed out about chapter three so we can move a little bit uh, forward with stuff we just have to make sure we're um you know progressing not waiting till the last minute and then i will need your survey questions in what about a week and i can't go any further than that you got to have them in by then uh, we can't go past that because we got to get the survey up otherwise we need to get the data so that uh, you you can all start crunching numbers uh, and doing your get, getting your project started. Oh, speaking of which, so if you go to the main Ventura College webpage and you go to the top where it says academic calendar and click that, that gives you the academic calendar, but also the, uh, the final schedule has been submitted. Now in this class, it's not as important, but a couple things to know about the final exam schedule. So they just put this out. They used to put it out before the semester started. In fact, it used to be out before people registered. So you could even check when your final was before you registered for a class. Um, they're putting it out later now. If I click that, oh, they kind of they kind of put some more orange in. They, they love to put orange on everything in the school. Um, they made it look a little different. Let's see. Yeah, it just looks like a little little more slick but the same basic information so this won't make a ton of difference for you in this class because you don't have a traditional final exam like where you're going to come in and take a test right this is a stats class right yeah um what's going to happen is your project's going to be due 
right? So here's, you, but you, you need to understand how final exams work at the school just so you can, you know, just so you can understand and be prepared for that. So um, it is school policy that I have to make something due on the final exam day. So whether that's a test that you come in, you know, it's kind of the traditional default. You come in, I hand you a test, you take out a pencil, you take the test, you hand me back your test, right? That's a thing that often happens during final exams. The other option that we have is to make a project due, um, but, but I can't just, I can't extend it past that because of the way the state pays us and not how, the way all that kind of stuff works. There's, there's rules in place. Something meaningful has to happen on that final exam date, right? So I can either have you come in and take a test or I can make your project due. Those are my choices. And I know that some of you have teachers, there's still teachers who do this where the final exam day is a pizza party. Like we're, we're not really supposed to do that. Um, we're, we're supposed to make that final day about something actually m meaningful for the class, right? Um, and making a project due is an acceptable substitute for making you come in and take an exam. Uh, so with that said, the final exam time is your last time that you can turn in the project. You, I cannot accept it after that. Okay, it's considered due at the time of the project. You can turn it in early. In fact, I usually give students a little bit of a bonus for turning their project in at the big, like, before finals week starts. So the last day of regular classes, in fact, let's double check when that is. So the last day of finals, let's look at the instructional calendar. Let's see, so this semester, you can't see it, but I can. So the last day of the semester, the regular classes is the 11th of May and 12th is the first day of finals. So what I would do is then say, if you turn in your project by May 11th, I usually give a little bit of a bonus on the grade. Now what you don't want to do is turn in a bad project early because the bonus will more than be canceled out by your bad grade on a bad project. So, but if you have done the work along the semester where we're working on it and then you take the time to get it done and you turn it in, you know, you go, yeah, I'm happy with this project. I'm ready to turn it in and you turn it in by the 11th. I give a little bit of a, a bonus to that. So you can turn it in early, but the last minute that the the project can be turned in and will be acceptable. And it'll automate in Canvas when you assign it, it's automatic. I'm going to go through later and set it so that right at the cutoff, you can't submit it anymore. Is oops, I now have this open twice. Let's clean that up. So, what are we? We are a Monday, Wednesday class at 10, right? No, yeah, Monday, Wednesday at 10. So, what you do is you find that start time. So, here we see Monday, Wednesday at 10 a.m. That's us. 10 a.m. Yeah, Monday, Wednesday at 10. And you can do this for your other classes. This isn't just for my class. This is for the entire college. Okay, so you go, okay, Monday, Wednesday at 10. So the column is the day. Okay, that's Monday the 16th. And the time is 10.15 to 12.15 p.m. So what I will have in Canvas is the, the assignment where you're going to come submit your project will close at 12.15 on May 16th. And nothing will get accepted after that. Right, unless, unless you have a very, very special circumstance, which generally people don't. Um, that's the last time that that will be submitted. I, I encourage you to, to, if you can, turn it in early because like what happened last semester is, so basically you could imagine, I have a ton of videos to watch for this project, right? So it's kind of nice if people are done and turn them in early, I can give them a little bonus for turning in it early. And then I can start watching the videos early so that I don't have to wait till everyone's turned them in to start grading, right? I can go through them. So kind of everyone benefits. You get a little bonus. I get to get started on the work and, and try to get it completed. A couple times what happens what, what was uh, I ran across students and I couldn't read their file. I couldn't see their video. I use VLC, which is, you know, those of you who use VLC, you know, that's kind of the, that player can play almost anything. So if, if VLC can't play it, it's, it's uh, that means you probably have to have some type of proprietary software in order to watch it or something, then I can't do that. So you're turning in a video, right? I wanna make this clear. Some people try to turn in a PowerPoint with audio. That's not a video. You have to turn in a video. So uh, one option, and we'll discuss this later in the semester, one option is to throw it on YouTube, and if you know, 
it's not going to go viral. It's a stats project. But if you want, you can just you, you can set the settings on your YouTube video so that people can only watch it with a link and then you post the link or, you know, however you want to do it is fine. But some people I went through and said, oh, your video is not in a format that can be read by a typical reader. Right. So then that person went, oh, oh OK, I'll, I'll put it in another format and get it to you. And then I could grade their project. But if you turn it in last minute and I can't watch it, then what's going to happen is you get a zero because I can't I can't watch your project. Right. So you need to make sure that you're putting it in like a normal format. The easiest thing to do is just put it on YouTube, send me the link and then whatever. Like you're not going to have to be embarrassed. Like, no, you know, YouTube is not going to start like showing your assignment to everybody. Um, you know, it's not going to be popular enough. So. Um, you know, put some thought into that about how you want to do that. Like I say, easiest thing to do, upload it to YouTube, send me a link. Some people make a file from whatever their iPhone or whatever, and then send me the file. Uh, that's fine. Just make sure it's like a typical file. You know, you can look that up. There's different files on, you know, for movie formats, but it has to be a, a normal one. Cause if I can't open it with VLC, um, th then it's, then, uh, you, then you've, submitted a poor format okay so um, but the last time I can take it is 1215 on the 16th now the school's pretty strict about that rule and you might go well can't uh, well you know something happened can't you just be nice and let me turn it in late and it's it's really difficult to do that because we have to make sure that we are treating everyone in the class in a way that is fair in other words basically like everyone else got their stuff done on time and then you you were trying to do it at the last minute and then your power went out. How is it fair to give you extra time when I didn't give all these other people extra time? Right. This isn't a this is not like a situ. You know, you have the whole semester to do the project. So it's not really like, a, well, I didn't have the tools to get it done earlier or something. You have the whole semester to do it. So it's kind of on you if you're waiting till the very last minute. OK. Um, and the, the school has a policy here. So for exams, no exams, uh, yeah, no exams or lecture classes are to be held prior to the final exam schedule. That's actually weird. They just added that wording in and that could be misinterpreted. That was poorly written. Um, uh, where's the thing I'm looking for? They have now, they've reordered this. Let's see. Here, request for early or late exam. Students may request a petition from the division office. Approved petitions must be sub, uh, submitted. Yeah, they have some typos in here. Like I say, they rewrote this, but um, uh, approved petitions must be submitted and filed in the office of the division dean prior to the exam date, which means if you have some type of an issue that's going to keep you from turning your thing in, uh, you have to fill out a form. You need the dean's signature. You need my signature and uh, you know people come to me and say oh i, I need an exception because um uh, I, I booked my disney cruise and i have to leave on it before uh before the final like we're, we're not going to give you special circumstances because you're going on a disney cruise right i hope you have a great time but you, I, you know that's not a good reason why other people should be held to one set of rules and you should be held to another the two times when this has not the two times that i've given and the dean has signed one of these exemptions. I think both times um, were women giving birth during the final. So, like, you know, uh, it was women who knew they were going to be, you know, giving birth around that time, and we set it up ahead of time. Um, and that's that's a pretty good excuse, right? That's a that's a normal part of being a human being. Um, it's medical related. Right. So in that case, you go, yeah, OK, that's that's a good reason for making an exemption that someone is giving birth. But like your computer didn't start up or something like that is not really going to be a good reason for turning th the thing in late. So please make sure you're getting it in early. Like I say, if you even just plan to get it done before finals week starts, like that last day of regular semester, that's great, because then if you have an emergency and something goes wrong, you still have more time to deal with it and, and get that thing done. Um, so that's kind of a that's that's a thing I see a lot of students do that actually is a reason that a lot of students fail is they're trying to do something at the very last minute. And then when it goes wrong, 
guess what? Your, your project or your assignment or your essay is now going to get a very poor grade. So, you know, just plan to do it a day early. And then if something goes wrong, you still have time to deal with it. Okay. Um, but, um, so if, if you're, you know, if you're going to be giving birth or having some kind of medical exemption or something that, that has to happen during the final, let me know and we can figure something out. But that very, like I say, two times in what, nine years, um, doesn't happen very frequently. So, um, you know, and just, just think about it. Um, you know, if you, if your excuse is a good one, do you really want to be standing in front of the Dean and say, yeah, I need your signature because I'm going on a Disney cruise. Like this is probably not going to go well. Right. So, uh, so just keep that in mind. That's new information. So you actually know exactly when your project will be due. So check the, you know, you can come find this whenever you want. In fact, you can find all your other classes too because your other class times are um, there. Okay, let's see. So with that said, let me take roll before I forget. Thanks again to everyone who's uh, making this easy on me. Let's see. All right, anyone who's on the YouTube stream, if you didn't put your name up there, let me know. So, or, you know, put it up there so I can count you as being there. Okay, let's see. And there's no Willie Dillon, right? Willie Dillon is not around. Willie D. No. Okay. Because that's who, who got dropped. Okay. So uh, let's see. Where was I with that set? So we took care of that time and day. Okay. So where are we? Yep. You. So your chapter one was due last week. Chapter two due today. So hopefully you're working through the lessons and the assessments, making progress with that. I'll talk a little bit about this graphical misrepresentations of data because one of the things you're going to do for your project, um, I mean, you have to do it on the homework, but one of the things you're going to do for your project is you're going to have some good visuals, right? That's part of it. You're showing visuals and you're talking about the knowledge related to those visuals. Um, so you want to be able to make good ones because people look at it. So. Uh, we're going to talk about what makes a good visual representation of uh, statistical data, what makes a bad one, what is usually used to misrepresent things and mislead people, um, all that kind of stuff. All right, so we'll talk about that today. And then I believe we're going to get into Chapter 3 and talk about the beginnings of Chapter 3. Chapter 3 is, by and large, fairly straightforward. Um, but re really, really important stuff. We're really starting to lay a foundation for actually calculating statistics and knowing what to do with those things, right? Um, it's very important that you're not just memorizing the things in the book. It's important that you understand, okay? Knowing, like the mean and the median that we're gonna talk about in a little bit, they're both very important. They're both very easy to calculate. So that's great, you can calculate a mean and a median, okay, good. But do you know when you should use a mean? And do you know when you should use the median instead of the mean? And do you know when you should be talking about both of them? 
uh, because uh, that's that's different in every situation. So it's that kind of idea. Don't just go, oh, I know how to calculate a mean. That's easy. Uh, you have to understand when do we use the mean? When do we prefer to use the median? When do we talk about both of them? Um, and it's not an easy answer. It's not just a, I can't just give you a list. I got you, Thade, thanks. I can't just give you a list and say, uh, when you're talking about business, then do this. When you're talking about politics, then do this. It doesn't work that way. Every situation, you have to use your critical thinking skills and go, hmm, I wonder, I wonder what's the best tool to use in this situation. And then, and then you have to figure it out. So we'll get to that in a little bit. First, we're going to talk about graphical misrepresentations of data. And that'll get you moving through chapter seven here. Or sorry, chapter three. It's due on the seventh looking at too many numbers at once. And then we'll move along to uh, scatter diagrams, least squares regression, hugely important chapter, but you have a, you have a little bit of time in, in between those. And again, I'm just gonna remind, because we can't have people missing this date. Remember by February 6th, I wanna see fully, fully nicely flushed out questions being posted by, uh, you know, every individual has to leave a post. Tell me your good, your questions. Right. Don't give me your rough draft questions or it's going to cause you problems all semester. Give me the ones that you and your group have talked about and you sort of worked out like that's the best way to say them and then submit them in there. OK, we have to have that. OK, so with that, where am I? Uh, graphical misrepresentations of data. So let's look in the, the book here. So there's. Um, oops, am I in the oops? This is what we're going to later. Let me find my. Bookmarks, let's see, I want page 82. There we go. Um, so there's a few different types of charts you're going to see along the way. We talked before about histograms and kind of looked at how to do that in, um, in StatCrunch. Uh, bar graphs, people confuse bar graphs and histograms. There's a couple key differences between bar graphs and histogram. The number one way that you can tell the difference, bar graphs are for qualitative data, things like eye color. Histograms are for numerical data, okay? So that's why in a bar graph, there's separations between the bars because why would blue eye bar be touching green eye bar? That doesn't make any sense. But it does make sense if you have a histogram for ages that age 32 would be going up and touching age 33, right? So um, I see people misuse those and they use the wrong one at the wrong time. And it sort of is a, it's a, it's a giveaway that you don't really understand two of the most basic uh, representations of data. So make sure you understand bar graph for qualitative data, histogram for quantitative data. Quantity means quantities, quant numbers, right? Amounts of things. Okay. Um, you can have a double bar graph or even a triple bar graph. Sometimes those are useful. We see these, um, you know, we're in meetings a lot of times that'll show like kind of like they have here, like male, female, except we'll see really complicated ones where they break down, say, success rates at the school, but they'll have them broken down by uh, uh, gender. They'll have them broken down by um, race and different things. And then you can kind of compare oh, what groups are we serving better than others and what can we do to make sure we're serving everybody better. But it's hard to get at that, you know, that kind of data unless you break it down in this way. Like, are we serving female students as well as male students? You know, are, are, what are the pass rates looking like? And there's actually a bit of a transition happening right now in education, and you kind of don't see it unless you look at these kind of graphs, right? There's been a lot of work for a long time, like making sure that females feel comfortable going into engineering and math and that kind of stuff. And that's great because we, we've seen a lot of improvements in the ways that the females can access education. We're actually starting to see a little bit of lopsided now where now we're sometimes in certain situations looking at the, the male counterparts, the male sides. Okay, how can we help the males get up to where the, the females are, right? So we're kind of trying to like ra get everybody raised up. But, you, you know, so these separate bar graphs are a nice way to tell the difference and go, oh, it looks like we're underserving this population. What can we do to do better? Right. How can we do better than we're doing now? Um, you know, and these these visuals can be helpful in that. Um, Proto chart is basically a um, it's basic. 
it's weird they have it together. But a Pareto chart just means you take your bars and you put them in order of decreasing, which is a convenient thing to do. See how they're decreasing from biggest to smallest? That's what you do with a Pareto. So it's, it's not really like a whole new thing. Um, pie charts, people use pie charts. Pie charts aren't great. People love to do it. The, you know, they kind of think it looks neat and it does. There's a time and place like a lot of books for a while. We're saying don't use pie charts. It's kind of a waste of ink. But now people don't print stuff as much. So that argument has gone away. But it's like if you look at this one here, like we can kind of go, OK, networking is the biggest one. And then there's these smaller pies. But it's a little tricky to tell, like, how much bigger is this green pie than this light brown pie? kind of hard to judge that right how much bigger is this brown pie than this blue one here it's like it's really hard to tell like you can tell this one's the biggest then this one then this one then this one you can put them in order but like how many times bigger is this blue one than this light blue one you can't really tell from the pie so it's hard to tell relatively how much bigger one piece is and that's that's what I think is the 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 thing that makes pie charts not a great choice. Does that mean you should never use a pie chart? No, you're going to be making judgment calls every time you do statistics, but also on this project. And you're going to say, I want to use a pie chart for this particular question. Go for it. Right. I'm not I'm not saying you should never like the, the guy who wrote this book, Triola, the sort of the default book around the nation for statistics. He will tell you don't use pie charts. Um, I will just say if you're going to use a pie chart, be able to answer the question, why did you think a pie chart was a good choice in this situation? And if you have an answer, okay, great. I'm good with that. But don't just use it because you're like, well, I don't know, they look neat and uh, it's easy to make, so I'm just gonna throw one in there. Like, you know, have an understanding of this is why I chose to use the pie chart. And sometimes there are valid reasons for using pie charts, okay? But there, there's some faults that people don't always see. This is one of the thing about statistics is you immediately start learning that like, Oh, that thing I kind of thought about statistics was totally wrong, right? And that's that's what's wrong is, is the, the general populace thinks they know things about statistics. But as soon as they start learning it, they're like, oh, I had statistics all, all wrong. You're not supposed to use the average for stuff sometimes, and you're not supposed to use pie charts, you know. Um, okay, scatter plots, hugely important. Scatter plots is a main part of the reason that I have you pick two quantitative questions for your survey because you need to be able to make a scatter plot, right? Because um, once you have the scatter plot, there's a whole type of analysis that we can do called uh, regression, correlation regression, line, line of best fit, least squares regression. Those are all different ways of saying the same thing. You want that to be in your project. Um, it's fairly straightforward. It looks really good. It can come up, uh, can help you come up with some interesting things to talk about during your project. So, um, so just be aware. Scatter plots are important. You're going to be making them, and we'll look at how to do that in Stat Crunch. As we, I forget if it's, is it next chapter? I think it might be the next chapter where we start going a little bit more in depth with scatter plots and using it for stuff. So just be aware of that. That's going to come up and be important. So when you see it now coming up, pay attention so that you can. Um, you can understand them because they're going to play a role. Here's what a scatter plot looks like. So see how we've got two numerical data. We've got well, this could be sort of argued that it's a label, but it's it's measuring years. So you could you know we can call it um, quantitative data. So we've got two axes of quantitative data, and these are pennies. This particular problem, I'm s I'll summarize for you because uh, they use this problem frequently throughout the book. They went through and they rounded up I don't know a few hundred pennies and they weighed them, right? So they put them on a little scale, highly sensitive scale, weighed the penny, and this is what it looks like when you, when you look at the scatter plot. So this graph, the way this is presented, can lead you to understand things that you, would, you wouldn't really see otherwise. If you just looked at a bunch of data, you have a column that has years and weights, and you just look at them, and you're like, I don't know, it just looks like a bunch of numbers to me. But once we organize it into a visual, you go, that's kind of weird. I kind of thought I would just get one big grouping where things are spread out. I didn't expect to see two clear cut groups here. You know, you would expect to see like some people might think, well, shouldn't every penny weigh the same? Well, I would guess that if you if you measured pennies uh, coming right off the assembly line at the mint when they're printing pennies, 
uh, you probably would see a little bit of a tighter grouping here for each of these groups would be a little bit tighter but uh, pennies get dirty they pick up a little bit of dirt on them sometimes they get damaged and a little bit of the metal gets chipped off or rubbed off or something and so you know you're gonna get a little bit of variation in pennies that have seen some use right but why this jump why are we seeing two distinct groups why aren't we just seeing kind of a big spread of pennies uh, in one big cloud well a lot of times what happens when you see something like this is you go there's a difference there's a difference between this group of pennies and this one well if I look it looks like the years are different so for pennies made after 1980 is it 83 they have they're lighter and pennies made before 1983 or heavier hmm I wonder what's going on there and then you look and you realize that in 1983 they changed the way pennies were made because it was costing too much so they went to a cheaper metal pennies used to be heavier like you could feel the, you can feel it if you have an old penny and a new penny in your hand you can tell which one is without looking at it you can tell which one's new and which one's old because there's a significant weight difference um, enough like sometimes the new pennies almost feel like kind of junky like they're so light um, uh, whereas the old ones had a little weight to it kind of felt like maybe there's a little quality there um, so so we can see that oh okay see that led us to ask a question which then gave us information we didn't know huh this is weird what happened in 1983 so maybe you do a Google search oh 1983 they changed the the types of metal that was used in making the penny so see how vi making this visualization has led us to learn something about the data which we were studying right so uh, very helpful whenever you see a gap in your data that should always be one of your questions go why is there a gap there I wonder what's going on with that gap sometimes it's just that your sample size was too small and so you're just gonna get a few gaps sometimes there's a reason that something is missing right in that particular area in this case the gap led us to uncover new information uh, that's what you need to be doing as a statistician is looking for things that may uncover interesting information about what you're looking at okay let's see all right okay where are we okay and then we get into um, oops, where, where, where's the second part? Here we go. Beyond the basics, this is the one that has to do with uh, bad graphs, critical thinking. Yeah, that's where 2.5 starts. So uh, what makes a bad graph? Now, some of you, some of you will make bad graphs unintentionally. Um, hopefully no one in this class is making a bad graph intentionally, but they happen. And part of the problem is that... Um, sometimes people make grad bad graphs on purpose to mislead you to make you have some kind of an emotional response or to give you an impression about something that they want you to believe even though the data doesn't really support the extremeness of the point of view that you're being shown um, the person has an interest in you believing it anyways whether it's to get you to buy a product or it's to get you to vote a certain way or it's whatever um, People want to mislead you, right? It was sort of this hyper-capitalist system. People just want your, your, they want money and power, right? So people are trying to, people are always trying to get your money and they're always trying to get you to give them your power. So, you know, buying and voting are two of the biggest things where you have, uh, you get to make a choice in what you buy. You get to make a choice in how you vote. And so there is an interest in people trying to affect those things, uh, right? So, um, like I say, sometimes bad graphs are just the person was incompetent, and sometimes bad graphs are people actually trying to mislead you. Um, here's the number one thing that you will see. Number one way, there's a couple of big ones, but the number one way is not including a zero in your axis. Now, sometimes there's good reasons for not including a zero in an axis. Sometimes if you include the zero, it's gonna, it's gonna make it really hard to tell differences but most of the time, that is not the case. Uh, probably 95% of the time, if you see a, a graph showing statistics and they don't have a zero on there, it's because the person is trying to uh, mislead you. They are trying to get you to think that a situation is much, much more severe than it actually is. So 
Um, I'm going to show you some examples in a minute and not so people don't just think I'm beating up on Fox News. Um, CNN here in the book, uh, they have an example of CNN doing it as well. MSNBC does it. Everyone does it. Um, all these news agencies do things poorly. OK, so this is we're not getting political in here. I'm just showing examples of things that these uh, these um, news, quote unquote, news agencies have done in the past. Right. So here's an example. Look at these two graphs. These two graphs tell a very different story when you look at them. So what if I told you these two graphs represent the same information? Right. So what's going on here? Well, the on the left, we have what, what are we looking at? We're looking at. Um, uh, you know, this was a big case, probably. I don't remember this was a long time ago. I don't remember what year it was, but there was this big the nation was all wrapped up in this uh, case about whether this woman's feeding tube should be removed. Um, she was like in a coma and everyone had different ideas about life and all that kind of stuff. So we won't get into that. But there was the question, do you agree with the court's decision to have the feeding tube removed? And then we've got Democrats, Republicans, independents. Now look at the scale on the left. It starts at 53 and it goes to 63. So what that does is it makes the difference between the Democrats and Republicans in this case and independents seem exaggerated because of this bar right here. Wh what the average person does when they look at this is they go, man, this bar is like six times or eight times what this one is. I don't think we, we talked about this this semester yet, did we? Um, uh, it's like six times as high as this. So you'd go, oh, the Democrats agree with this. Six times as many Democrats agree with this as Republicans. But that's not true, right? Because if we look over here where they use a zero scale and it goes zero to 100, oh, look, the, the difference between the Democrats and Republicans is much less pronounced, right? We start to see, oh, it's only about 8% difference between these two groups right here. Oh, so maybe this isn't a political issue. Maybe there is not a big divide along political lines in this particular case. So uh, someone showing you this is trying to get you to, you know, get that political part of you. If you're whatever, if you're on one side or the other, they're trying to get you to go like, oh, all the other Democrats think this way. Oh, I guess that maybe I should think that way, too. Or if you're Republican, you're like, oh, what, what is going on here? Look at how much less we are. What's what's the deal? Where if you look at this, you go, oh, yeah, a little little more with the Democrats, but roughly the same, approximately the same. Right. So that's really important. Right. The difference between these. And you see this all the time. Right. Here's a business week. Um, you know, insider that has put there's there's websites to go through and they actually do analysis of the way that Fox News does graphs um, poorly. Uh, and you really like this is a situation. Notice that you can kind of look and you can go, I think they're designing this graph. Like in this case, it, it's hard to argue that this was not intentionally misleading. So sometimes they'll leave off the Y scale completely. So you don't even know what it represents. But why did they put it on the right? That's not done a lot. Usually you want things on the left. People read from left to right, uh, at least in this country. So uh, generally you want to put information on the left. You would do that. The way reason you would put it on the right or not include it is because you're trying to hide the fact that there's no zero on this scale. Because if you look at these numbers, this bar is 35% and this bar is 39%. Well, the difference between 35% and 39% is 4%, right? Except this doesn't look like two bars that differ by 4%. This bar looks like it's about five or six times as high as this one. So if you looked at this, you'd go, oh my God, it's like five times what it used to be. And then someone, you know, some statistician in the room goes, no, look at the Look at the, uh, the scale. It doesn't start at zero. There's almost no difference between these two bars. But most people don't get that far. They just look at the picture. People don't read very much. Uh, they look at the picture and go, oh, my God, that's a huge difference. And then you sort of stop and go, wait a minute. Maybe that's not as big a difference, right? They do this all the time with stuff. Um, where is the... Some of these, some of the times they just do stuff poorly. Like here, look at 9.0 and 8.6 have the same height. They're not consistent with their scale. That's a different. Um. Here's another one. We're not like, th like this value over here, Q1 of 2009, looks like it's nothing compared to this 
2011Q2. So federal welfare received. It makes it look like in these years, um, you know, when Obama was office, it makes it look like welfare spending went up three or four times. Like, you know, like it tripled or quadrupled over those years. But look, it went from about 97 million to 106 million. And you go, wait, that's not triple. It didn't quadruple. Why does the graph make me think it quadrupled? Because you're not using a zero scale. So this kind of thing, you know, even if you go, well, oh, no, I'm trained. I know I, I can see that it didn't triple. Like it's, it, it does something. Your mind is automatically trying to make that connection, right? We're not as good at it reading bad graphs as we think we are. It's like texting while driving. We all kind of think we're good at it, but research shows we're actually all bad at it, right? So even you go, oh, no, I, I see what's going on. It's hard to get away from that, that, that first understanding that say, well, this thing looks like it's about four times higher than this one. It's hard to do. Same thing here. This looks, this looks like a huge increase. In this case, it actually is a reasonable increase, but it's more, this looks like more than double, right? This looks like it's gone up five or six times. Um, so you get the idea. Right. You get what that zero axis is hugely important. Um, and for 95 percent of the work that, you, you know, people will do be doing, you should be including a zero axis. This is very rare occasion when you're dealing with really, really big numbers. You might be able to make the argument that um, you don't need to include a zero scale, but then you should mention it. You should like put it out there so you're not trying to sneak it by anyone. Pictographs. They look great. Statistically, they are not good. So what is a pic pictograph? It's like this, where they take a picture and they blow it up. So a two-dimensional picture getting bigger, or in this case, three-dimensional, to show differences in values, That's uh, this is a no-no because your brain starts to think one thing, and then your analytical you know, understanding of statistics thinks a different thing, and now your brain is sort of fighting with yourself. It's confused. So why is that? Well, when you take a two-dimensional shape and you double the length and you double the width, you've actually made the area of that shape four times bigger. And that's a common mistake people do is they're like, oh, I've got, this is our base amount. I want to double it. So they make it twice as tall, twice as wide. Well, the visual understanding is that you now have four times the area. So people go, oh, it's four times as much. No, no, it's just double. And, th and then you have this confusion that gets created. And in this case, since they're three-dimensional objects, it would actually be eight times, because if you doubled each dimension, the block would be eight have eight times the volume as the original one, so even more misleading. So as much as there's a tendency to put cute little pictures in your statistical analysis, don't do it, okay? It just, it just leads to confusion. So we want to use bars. We, the reason we use the basic shapes is because when we make the bar twice as high, we want the area of that bar to double. We don't want to see it going in multiple dimensions, and then we get um, we get um, areas that sort of there's like a little clash in our brain where our brain is thinking one thing, and then we're telling it a different thing, and it just makes the analysis harder. So kind of the two big things to do, don't use cute pictures. Just use the traditional stuff the stack crunch can do for you and try, you should, if you're not using a zero scale on a graph that you're, you're working on, you should have a good explanation as to why, right? And if the, if your answer is, well, the values are so close together, it's hard to tell them apart, then maybe that's the interesting thing is that the values are actually really close together. They're not that far apart, right? That's sort of the, the deviation that Fox Fox News made in those examples that we were looking at. So those are the two things, two big things, okay? Okay, and then, um, right. So that kind of wraps up chapter two as far as visuals. Big thing with your visuals, make sure things are well labeled. X-axis, Y-axis, and title should be labeled with units. So that like your goal should be to label things so well that no one has to ask you like, what does this represent? Right. If I have to ask you that, then, you know, you've kind of lost the little game we're playing. Right. You, I should be able to just look at it and go, oh, I know what this represents. Right. OK, let's see. Where are we? Let's go. Let's uh, let me look at my notes. I want page. We did that. I want 102 measures of center. OK. 
Okay, so we're on the chapter three. This is uh, this is, one's a little bit different than our work. We're getting into, uh, but it, I mean it's the same idea, but I'm it's a different book. So we're getting into measures of central tendency. I don't know. I probably will talk a little bit about dispersion today. We'll see how much time we have, and we'll see how how far we get through uh, through things. So let's see. I don't need that anymore. Let's go down here. Uh, so we're getting into what we call descriptive statistics. Descriptive statistics are where you have a bunch of data, you throw it into StatCrunch, you tell it to do certain things, and you get numbers that represent something. That's called descriptive statistics. You're describing something that was there in the data. Later in the semester, we get into something called inferential statistics. Inferential, you're inferring. That's where you're starting to do more in-depth analysis and you're trying to make connections and you're inferring things about your data, inferential statistics, inferring, you're sort of trying to make conclusions about things, okay? So for right now, it's a little more descriptive. It's basically like StatCrunch is just gonna crunch these numbers for us, but we need to know what they mean. We need to know when to use them, why we're using them, and what they really represent. Because most people that talk about, you know, most people you hear use the word average. If you make them talk about it for a little bit, it's clear they don't even understand what the average is. And then some people go, oh, well, when I say average, I really mean the mean. And that's, that's usually what people mean. But there also are, you know, some very basic misunderstandings even about the mean um, that, that people have right that you you know I'll see this on a, on a regular basis and then you try to get students to understand oh that thing I thought before didn't make sense so the first thing we're gonna look at is measures of center what is a way that we can talk about the center of a set of data right you have to realize uh, remember the graph we were looking at a little while ago on that scatter plot where it was a bunch of little dots around there you're not just describing one point when you solved an equation in algebra the the solution at the end was very simple right if you had an equation and you solved it and you figured out that x equals 2 that's the whole story man x equals 2 that's it how, how much was x 2 is there any more to talk about no that's just it x is 2 what, what else do you want to know with statistics it, it's much more in depth because you're not talking about a single point you're talking about a collection of data points and those data points can relate to each other in various ways. So we have to develop measures and ways of talking about those data points and how they relate to each other in a way that is meaningful and helpful for us to understand our statistics. And one of the big ones, like measures of center and measures of dispersion that we're gonna talk about, um, this is like the first two things you, th you should think about when you, look at, when you get your data back, it, you know, assuming it's quantitative data, should immediately think what's the center what's the what's the spread what's the, the dispersion okay so a measure of center is a way of sort of like what if you were pinning your data you had like a like a cloud representing your dots you were gonna pin it on a cork board where would you pin it right we'd kind of like to know where the center is that's like when people are asking about and this usually they're using the wrong tool when they say what's the average on the on the exam um, what they usually mean is what is the mean, which we'll, we'll get to in just a second. But what they usually want to know, they're making an assumption that the mean happens in the middle, which is not exactly true. But the mean is a loose center uh, measure of the center of the data. So what people are usually saying is like, well, tell me the average. And if I beat the average, that means I'm in the top half of the class, right? It doesn't actually mean that. We'll see an example in a few minutes. Um, but that's kind of what people want to know. What's a rough estimate of the middle? Am I above it or am I below it? Um, but we have a couple of different ways of measuring center, which uh, it seems confusing. Students will go, well, what's the right one? Just give me the right one. There is no right one. There are different, just like you have a toolbox, right? And you have different tools for a different job. I go, this part of the job requires me to use this screwdriver. Okay, this part of the job requires me to use the claw on the back of the hammer and get a nail out. This part of the job requires me to shave off a little bit of the wood. You're using different tools to do different things. You wouldn't, you wouldn't go to a carpenter and just say, I see you got all this like whole toolbox, but like what's the right tool to build a house? What's the right one? You know, he or she is gonna go, well, 
use this tool for this job and this tool for this job. You kind of have to know what they are. So the mean, or what is sometimes called the arithmetic mean, um, is one that people are most familiar with. This is what most people mean when they say the word average. In statistics class, we don't use the word average because it is misleading. And it's not really specific to which tool you want to use to measure the center. And like I've mentioned, um, it, it, when we use the word average, it allows us to be lazy by not making the decision. Am I talking about the mean or am I talking about the median? And then people kind of pick from both. And say so you, you have to pick one tool. Right, yeah. yeah, you have to pick one tool. So the mean of a set of data is the measure of center found by adding the data values and dividing the total by the number of data values. So like, let's say you have four exams in a semester and you wanna know the mean score. Well, you take your four scores, you add them up, and then you divide by four and you get your mean, which is a lot of times what people will call the average, but you get the mean, okay? Um, I want to show you this because you're going to see it come up in various situations. This looks confusing. People go, what's that symbol? I don't know what that is. That's Greek. It's, it's Greek capital sigma. And in mathematics and statistics, when you see the capital sigma, it kind of looks like a weird script capital E. When, pe when you see that in mathematics or statistics, it means add a bunch of things up. So whatever you got, add them up. Okay. So that's why when they say sigma x, your, the X's, the, this is going to be consistent throughout the course. The X's are generally your data points. So when you see capital Sigma X, that means add up all your data points. That's all that means. Lowercase n, very consistently in statistics, that means the number of data values you have. So when, when you're doing your projects here after you take the survey, n will be the number of responses you got to your survey question. Okay. It's, it's our sample size, basically. It's always going to be the size of our data. So in this case, this looks like a really fancy thing. We got, I don't know. We got some new letter I'm not used to, and then there's all these different variables. All this means is add up your data values. Sigma X means add them up. Divide by N. Divide by the number of those data values. Okay, And that's the mean. Super, super easy to calculate, um, You know, assuming you don't have 100,000 data values. Um, so super easy to calculate, super easy to understand what's going on there. Um, right, with the mean. And here's an example. Uh, let's say we've got word counts. Oh, the, for this chapter, the example was, you know, uh, does one gender talk more than the other? So they were looking at like the mean of the uh, values. So you can see the, the counts that they got were these ones here. It counted how many words people said. So sigma x just means add up all those values. How many data values did they have? Five. So then you divide by five, and you get that the mean is 20,456.6 words, right, for the word counts. Okay, so that's how the mean works. Um, there's some pros and cons to the mean. So I don't remember if there. A sorry, there's a page I'm looking for that I don't see, so I'll just do this from uh, memory. Okay, so things about the mean. Most people like the mean because it's what they usually think of when they talk about a measure of center. Um, the mean has an advantage over the median in that the mean uses every data point in its calculation. You'll see this is a double-edged sword. In certain sets, it's, the, it's an advantage that the mean uses, but in certain sets, it's actually going to be problematic for the mean. So that is every single data point gets used in the calculation. You might think, well, that seems normal. Why would you not count every single data point? Well, if you remember back, we brought up outliers last time. Outliers are extreme values that are very far away from the most of your data. And so what happens is in the mean, one outlier can really pull your mean in one direction and kind of mess up everything. So let me kind of show you. Let's see, like here's, um, let's see, test scores. So let's look at an example of the mean and I'll show you how to calculate some of this stuff in StatCrunch. So let's say that, you know, test scores in my class were, you know, 97, 92, 94, 88, 
87, maybe a 72, and then you got like 85, 93, 91. So I'm just making these up. And then uh, two people did very, very poorly. They didn't really study at all. So someone got a five, someone got a three, right? So this happens where some people like stop doing homework, stop doing work, but then they show up to take the test going, well, maybe, maybe I'm going to get a good score. And then it, it doesn't work that way. Okay, so we want to go into stats. I'm going to go down to summary stats. Summary stats is going to tell us a bunch of things, and it's a bunch of the basics that we need to know. So I'm going to go over to summary stats on my columns. I only have one column, but I have to pick test score, so I'm highlighting test score. And it's like, hey, what do you want to know? Well, notice they've already populated this list. These are like the most often requested things. So when you do summary stats, um, it's going to give you a bunch of these typical ones that we want to know. You can pick more if you want. You can edit this list and have more things come over here. Like some of you for the homework, will this is what you're going to be looking for when we get to standard deviation, unadjusted standard deviation. Some of you are going to want to, you need to see that for certain problems. So you'll pick that and, and look at that. Um, let's see, in this case, I think we're ready to compute. So I hit compute. And what does it show me? So we've got, um, it's saying your co the column is of test scores. It's saying N is 11. So let's look, yep, 11 is how many data values we've got. Okay, good. So that's what N is, little N is how many data values you have. The mean, 73.36363636. So we, we'll just go with 73 for the, um, for the mean. Now, here's what I see students do sometimes, because sometimes I'll even ask. When you're asking about the mean, what is it you really want to know about the test? When they say, what was the average? What do you really want to know? Like, what is, the, what is the thing you're trying to figure out? Is it that you're trying to figure out if you're in the top half or bottom half, or if you hit the middle? Like, what is it you're actually getting at? Um, and people will go, yeah, I want to know if I'm in the top half. The mean doesn't tell you what's the top half and the bottom half. So. Um, if you look, the mean is 73, right? So by a lot of people's reasoning, you'd go, well, half the class scored above 73 and half the class scored below 73. But if you look at it, three people scored below 73. This person was like right near the mean with a 72. And these people, these outliers, it dragged the mean way down. So you have an artificially low mean. So you can have 90% of the class score above the mean, and then all 90% of those people think they're in the top 50%, but they aren't. So um, this is an example of how a couple low scores can throw off the mean of something, and then it's not a very good measure of center. Okay, so it's, uh, it's sort of misleading in this case. All right, so then let's go back to the book. What are we looking at here? So then enters the median. The median is another measure of center that we use on a regular basis. Every single quantitative problem you do, you should calculate the mean and the median, both of them, and then decide which one or both to include in that particular project. There's never really a time where you're like, let's not even worry about the median. Look what it is and then decide if you should include it or not. So what is the median? The median of a data set is the measure of center that is the middle value when the original data values are arranged in order of increasing or decreasing magnitude. So this is actually what people really want to know when they ask me, what was the, what was the average? And they want to know if they're in the top half of the class. This is really what they want because as I just showed you, the mean, 90% of the class can be above the mean but only 50% should be above the median. That's the definition of the median. Now, the way the median works is it doesn't take every single data value into, into the calculation. It just finds the middle, okay? Now, the, you might go, well, it seems like you're leaving a lot of information out of the calculation, but it also means that the median is not affected by outliers to the same extent that the mean is. So while one outlier can really throw your mean in one direction or the other, the median is not going to be thrown off by that value so much. So um, basically, if you're going to calculate it by ham, you have to order your va data values, which is easy because in StatCrunch, it's just a matter of saying, sort my values, and then it does. And then you pick the one in the middle. 
and the truth is you'll just get it from your summary stats anyways but you should understand how to find the median so if it's an odd number of data values you just put them in order and you pick the one in the middle so that's pretty straightforward but you go what if there's an even number then what's the middle right imagine you have four four data right? so picture this in your head you have four data values going from least to greatest what's the middle value well there's two in the middle which is the one that we want well so what you end up doing in that case is you take the mean of the two middle values and that gives you what we what we call the median in that case okay so it's a pretty straightforward calculation you'll be fine and that's why they say here never use the term average when referring to a measure of center use the correct term mean or median because otherwise people it's very confusing when people start saying average and then a lot of times they don't even know what they're talking about because they're getting mixed up between mean and median so pick one so back to our group notice that the uh, notice that in our summary stats it gave us the median as well it gave us the median of as well so that means our middle data value is 88 so that's very different than a 73 see when the class asked me like what was the mean Oh, it was 73. And anyone who did better than 73 is like, oh, okay, I did pretty good then. But if you ask, well, what was the median? Oh, it was 88. And then you might go, oh, I didn't do as well as I thought I did. 50% of the class did better than 88? Yeah, okay. Well, then I, I guess it wasn't as hard a test as I thought it was. Uh, people did pretty good on it, right? So see how your mean and median have a, have a difference between them? A lot of times your mean and median are gonna come out really close to, together. If you have your mean far away from your median, then probably what happens is you have an outlier in your data and you should look for it and you should always investigate outliers. Ask yourself, why do I have this outlier here? What's going on here? It's going to help you understand your data better. Okay. So in this case, the fact that our mean and median are spread out from each other is helpful to us. We go, oh, that's that's something to think about and sort of consider why the data works that way that it does okay standard deviation we'll talk about uh, maybe today maybe not um, you've got your median you've got your range the range is just how wide is your data right is your data spread across like five data like five uh, numbers or is it spread across 10,000 numbers Right, so in this case, the range is 94. Basically what you take is you take your highest value, which I think in this case is 97, and you subtract your lowest value, which in this case is three. 97 minus three is 94. That means our data value is spread out over 94 units. So if like you were to go to graph it, you'd need at least 94 units in order to capture all, all your data. Okay, so um, th th we'll get into more of this when we talk about the measures of dispersion. But that's another big thing we're going to talk about is how spread out is the data? Is it all clumped together or is it spread out? What's the shape of it? The min and the max are pretty obvious. Min is the lowest value. Max is the highest value. Uh, quartile 1 and quartile 3 we'll talk about later. Not today. We'll get to those another day. Um, right now we're talking about measures of center. There's a few other minor ones. The mode is the data value that occurs the most times. Um, the mode comes up sometimes, but the, the two heavy hitters for central tendency are the mean and the median. You want to know those very, very well, and you should be thinking about them on every bit of statistics you ever do. You start off by wondering, I wonder what the mean and median are, and then you make note of it and go, okay, I'm going to think about that as I look at the rest of my data and maybe come back to these later. Okay. The mode can be helpful. Uh, Mid-range. Um, the mid-range is uh, not used very often. You basically take the highest, the highest and lowest data values and you find the mean of those uh, and you get like, you know, the value in the middle. It's not really helpful because you don't know where the rest of your data value lies and also this is extremely um, subject to distortion by an outlier. So you won't see the mid-range come up very much either. Right, critical thinking, only use these tools in cases that make sense. Does it make sense to take the mean of zip codes? No. Does it make sense to find the median telephone number? No. Right, 
these things are not helpful. What if you had, um, what if you're using numbers and you generally want to try to avoid this? I see students try to do this. Sometimes it works okay, but most of the time you'd be better off just asking it a different way. But sometimes things get coded when you're doing a survey so that there's like choice one would be Democrat, choice two, Republican, choice four, conservative. And then what people do later is they try to take the mean of those numbers, but it's not meaningful because one is not really, you're not counting something, it's code for Democrat. Two is code for Republican. Three is code for liberal and so on. So um, you don't want to apply um, analysis to those in that way where you're taking the mean of it. Uh, let's see where am I? You'll get into frequency distributions. So you talk about the mean from a frequency distribution. Just follow along in the homework. I find most students are pretty comfortable with that. Um, they're able to get through it. If you have questions, of course, come talk to me. But most people are fine with it. Uh, weighted means are fine. Weighted means are important. See students a lot of times not understand their grades. They're like uh, more and more, especially the last last semester. Excuse me, I got the hiccups. You know, students, what I'm seeing is students, uh, not every student, but more students, unable to have a realistic understanding of their own grades because they, you know, if you look in the syllabus, I think in this class it's 50-50, so it's pretty straightforward. But in a class where, you know, the homework is 30% and maybe tests are... 70 percent then students will just sort of not realize oh that means test scores are worth twice as much as the homework scores so um, and students just kind of treat them like they're equally weighted well if they're not equally weighted then you shouldn't calculate them as equally weighted so um, kind of we want to understand this weighted mean again pretty straightforward in the homework as far as i can tell um, skewed S data that is wait where this should be Why is this in this section? Seems like this should be in the next section, but we'll talk about it. Um, a distribution of data is skewed if it is not symmetric and extends more to one side than the other. A distribution of data is symmetric if the left half of the histogram is roughly a mirror image of the right half. So we can have data that's skewed one way or the other, right? The, these higher pictures, those are skewed. This one in the middle is more not skewed. Sometimes by looking at how your mean and median interact, you can, you can like gain a suspicion of what your graph is going to look like. If your mean and median are close together, you probably have a relatively symmetric graph. If your mean and median are separate from each other, and then maybe, you know, you can put that mode in the calculation too, but oftentimes you're going to have mean and median. Uh, you may have some skewed data. It doesn't necessarily mean that you will, but it means that you, you might have some skewed data there. And this, the way that your data is skewed make, means it's like it's distorted in one direction. So imagine if we took this picture here and then you were standing on one side and you pushed this mound. It would sort of look like this then. It would get distorted this way sort of. So it just means your data is kind of piling more up on one side and then on the other it's more spread out. Okay, so that's skewed data. The way your data skews is usually helpful. Like we looked, I think last time we looked at the graph of ages at the college and it looked kind of a little bit like this, like a real graph of ages at the college. It would be a little more extreme than this. This would be a little bit steeper and then it would probably be a little bit steeper down here. But what you're seeing is right at around 18, 19, you see a big group of students, hardly anyone younger than 18, but then you do see more variety on the older side. So people who are in their early 20s, some people in their mid 20s, a few less people in their late 20s, even less people in their 30s. And the older you get, the less you see students of that age, but it's not like a clear cutoff like on the left. Right, see how it's spread out a little bit more on the right? That's what skewed means. And you, whenever you have skewed data, you want to look at, look at it and ask yourself, I wonder why I got skewed data. And if you do that for the school, like we talked about last time, oh, part of the reason it's skewed is because people less than 18 are usually doing a different course of action for their education. And therefore, th we are not going to see as many of those people at Ventura College. Right, so that skewedness can kind of give you 
a um, an explanation that you didn't previously understand. Wait, where's my? Here we go. Measures of variation. Okay. So take away the big two for cent central tendency or measures of center: mean, median. Always calculate them. Try to understand them. Uh, see what makes sense for you. Okay. Measures of variation. Variation can be really important. Um, understanding that variation right so they talk about like um, you know w one is the units of time okay so back in the old days like the f the measurement foot you know if you were you you worked out on a farm somewhere and like you need to know how long something was in feet how'd you measure it you just make something up that's roughly a foot like who decides what a foot is right so what would happen is you get these different measurements of time. Well, you don't want one person to measure one foot and then someone else measures a foot and they get a different distance. You want everyone using that same measurement. So w one of the things that has happened over the you know last couple hundred years is they've come up with better and better ways of having a standard unit, like a standard foot, a standard second, you know, the, the different types of measurements that you can make. And, um, Seconds are really important for timekeeping, and timekeeping is really important for really everything at this point because your computers run on time. You know, clocks, if, without a clock, your computer won't function right. So there's good reason to have better and better accuracy for time. And then believe it or not, we actually use time to measure distance now because that's the most accurate way to do it. So that puts a dependency for linear measurement on time as well. So we have to have really, really good measurements for a second. And if you think about it, like, well, how do you do that? You go, well, can't we just look at a watch? But that's circular if you think about it because the person creating the watch needs to know a measurement the unit of seconds in order to make the watch correctly. So you can't just go, oh, I'll just rely on a watch. How does the watchmaker know what a second is, right? And, um, and so that's why they've, they've done more and more work to measure seconds to where now it's extremely, uh, has extremely small variation so that um, they use basically the breaking down of a cesium atom. They were like the radioactivity of cesium, very predictable, the rate at which it's decaying. So they use that decay to mark off one second. You go, okay, well, that's pretty good. So that's better than how they used to do measurements where a second might vary a little bit depending on, you know, who was measuring it out that day. You get s too much variation. Now we have very little variation. And now that we can measure a second to extremely high accuracy, then what they do is they measure, say, a meter to be the time that light travels under these conditions in this tiny, tiny fraction of a second. And then everyone can agree, oh, that's what a meter is, right? We all so, so sometimes what you want is very small variation. Sometimes you want a lot of variation. So let's do an example. Uh, let's look at test scores. Let's actually get rid of. Oh, let's. I'll just rewrite it. Oh, let's see. I should probably blow this up a little, huh? See it a little better. Okay. So what we have here is. Oh, let's go a little smaller there. Okay. Okay. So two possible outcomes. Let's say I'm teaching two classes. Okay, so someone has a question on the homework. Um, I can help you after class with the 2.3 homework for sure, or towards the end of class here. Um, so uh, two classes, right? Uh, I, have, I have a stats class. I'm just making this up as hypothetical. Stats class on Mondays. Everyone took the test and they got an 80. Oops, did I go one too far? Yeah, this should be, I went too far there. Um, everyone got 80s. So guess what I'm going to find if I take the mean or the median? I want to calculate those. Can any, does anyone know? Just think to yourself if you can predict what it's going to be. The mean would be 80, right? Add up all these 80s and divide by 10, you're going to get 80. Same with the median, 80 as well. So notice the mean and median are equal to each other in this case. 
But notice we have zero variation. There was no variation at all in these problems. Everyone got literally the same exact score that everyone else did. Okay, let's look at something else. Let's look at the summary stats for the second set of tests where some half the class got 60s and half the class got 100. So if I look at that, do var 6, compute. Now notice I have two of these up at the same time, and now I can compare them. Well, let's see. In the class that got part... Oh, whoops, I did the same thing twice, didn't I? Uh, I don't need one of those. Let's, let me fix this. I used the wrong column a second ago. Which one's which? Test scores is the 80s. Bar 6 is the 100. Okay, anyway, same conclusion. I just, I think I referenced the wrong one. Notice how both of these scenarios, they both have a mean of 80 and they both have a median of 80. So these classes, very different situations. It's very different when everyone in the class gets an 80 versus half the class got 100 and half the class failed and got a 60. Those are different situations. And yet when we just look at the measures of, ten of central tendency, we can't tell the difference. The mean just says 80 and, uh, and the median is 80 for both of these cases. So the measures of central tendency are not showing us a difference in these two sets, but these sets are fundamentally very different from each other. So what we then need is another measurement that we can use to apply to these sets that will tell us a difference. And that's what uh, variation is. So we have a few. Uh, the range can be important. That's just the biggest data value minus the smallest one. That tells you like how, how big of a graph you need so you can fit all your data points on there. That's helpful. But the big one is standard deviation. Standard deviation, you will be calculating for every quantitative question that you have. You, you need to have it in there. Sometimes you will use these other measures of, cent of dispersion, but the big one is standard deviation. Like I mentioned with central tendency, sometimes you use the mean, sometimes you use the median, sometimes you use both. With, um, with dispersion, how spread out is your data, you're going to use the standard deviation every single time but you may also use another one. You may bring up the, the range or something like that, but the standard deviation is, should always be discussed. The standard deviation of a set of sample values denoted by lowercase s, so when we're taking the standard deviation of a sample, which was what we will do most of the time, it's lowercase s, is a measure of variation of values about the mean. In other words, it's measuring how far, like how spread out are your data values from the mean. Okay, so the mean is part of the calculation. Um, it is a type of average deviation of values from the mean that is calculated by using a specific formula. Now, the formula is a little intense. That looks kind of scary to a lot of people. Good news, you don't have to calculate them by hand. StatCrunch is going to do it. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, just understand that that standard deviation is measuring how far each data point is from the from the mean and then it's like it's kind of taking the mean of those differences okay we call those differences well actually we won't get into that but um, that's what we're looking at so that standard deviation is a measure of variation f of all values from the mean how far are things from the mean? If you have a high standard deviation, it's really spread out. Low standard deviation, everything's in tight together. The value of the standard deviation S is usually positive. It is zero only when all data values are exactly the same. You cannot have a negative standard deviation. It wouldn't make sense. How spread out are your da data values? Negative five. What? What does that mean? That doesn't even sound right, right? So we'll look back at our example in a second. The value of the standard deviation S can increase dramatically with the inclusion of one or more outliers. So you throw one outlier in there, that standard deviation can blow up. But that makes sense because an outlier is going to have a really large distance from the mean. And if that's the case, then you have a really large value in your standard deviation calculation and it's going to blow up. Um, another really convenient thing, the units of the standard deviation S are the same as the original units. So it's just really convenient if you talk about the, you know, if your measurement is in meters and then your standard deviation would also be in meters. 
so you can compare them they they sort of fit together there's another thing called the variance and the variance just can be confusing because if your if your original unit was meters then your variance will be meters squared and it's usually hard to compare meters to meters squared right it's like if you measure a wall of the room you're in you measure how long it is and then you find the area of the wall usually those numbers aren't helpful to compare to each other that much right so um, so it's useful to have that same unit in there so let's look back at our example so notice that our two test scores here so one class got all 80s the other class half got 100 half got 60 we couldn't tell the difference looking at the mean or the median but look at our standard deviations those are very different the class that got all 80s, their standard deviation was zero because there literally was no deviation. Every data point was right at the mean, so there is zero for measurement between the data points and the mean, therefore our standard deviation was zero. Down here, where half the class got 100s and half the class got 60s, those data values were all very far away from the mean. So our standard deviation is 21.081851. Okay, so it's just that that standard deviation gave us now we have a new way of understanding the difference between a class where everyone gets 80 and a class where half the people get 100 and half the class gets 60. Right. We want to tell the difference between those standard deviation does it. <coughs> this book, the homework that we're using for this course, does this even more than a t typical book would. What you need to understand is there's two different standard deviations. There's a standard deviation for when you're calculating a sample and a different, similar but different standard deviation when you're calculating a population. Okay, so remember the difference between those. Remember all that vocabulary we did at, at the beginning and I said was very important. Um, it is very important uh, because you have to know when you're dealing with which one. So, and, and I get um, a couple questions about this on the homework when students haven't quite put those pieces together and it doesn't quite make sense to them yet where they'll be using the sample standard deviation for a homework problem and they keep looking at it and like they're just a little bit off and they're like why is my problem just a little bit wrong like it's close I'm hitting standard deviation what's the problem the problem is that you're trying to use sample standard deviation on a homework problem that requires population standard deviation and that's what I showed you earlier if you go to the um, when you go in here there's the standard deviation is one of your choices but there's also this unadjusted standard deviation that's the population one so you want to read carefully I know some people like they read so fast through problems that they miss half of what's in there if if you see that they're talking about population for a problem, you got to make sure you use the population standard deviation, not the sample standard deviation. The numbers will, will be close. That's why I say some people are like, I don't know, my value is really close. It's coming from StatCrunch. Why is it always off a little bit? Because you're just choosing the wrong one. Okay, so make sure you're careful about that. Um, right. Uh, let's see, make sure I say what I want to say here. Yeah, Steve mentioned standard deviation of a population. It's a little bit different. Uh, variance. Variance is important, but it's the variance is literally just the standard deviation squared. So if you just take the square of the standard deviation, you get the variance but it leads to kind of weird units um, and it's not used quite as much as the standard deviation. So I think you have some homework problems on the variance, but it's, it's pretty straightforward and we'll usually talk about things in terms of standard deviations. Um, we're gonna start looking for unusual values in a data set. If you have unusual values, you want to look at those because you want to, sometimes by figuring out how something is different, it helps you figure out how everything else is the same. So if you look at an outlier and you go, hmm, what's different with this data point? It gives you some insight into the set as a whole. So, but, but how do we decide when a value is unusual and when it is sort of 
typical? When is, when is it usual and when is it unusual? Well, our, our rule of thumb is just gonna be that if a data point is more than two standard deviations from the mean, so if the standard deviation um, or the, the measurement for that particular point is, we'll talk about Z scores coming up, but if that's more than two standard deviations from the mean, then you should look at that point because that's starting to be um, interesting and, and we can gain some insight to it. Um, right, we talked about those. Here's, here's like our normal graph, right? Bell-shaped, symmetric bell-shaped curve. these we don't need to talk about okay kind of perfect place to end with that um, with the standard deviation so we talked about that um, so you should be able to be working on some of you already done this but you should be able to be working through 3.1 3.2 and really you can work through the rest of them as well it's just that um, I kind of wanted to give it an overview because those are really important topics it's all important but um, we have a little bit more time, so we'll talk about some of this stuff going forward, but in some, you know, I might get a jump on the next chapter. We'll just see. I'll have to take a look at what I want to talk about next time. We'll see where people are at. So uh, make sure you're paying attention to the homework. Make sure that your group is working now to get your survey questions together. I know you have a week, um, but if you wait till the last day, you're going to end up causing yourself a lot more work over the course of this semester. Meet with your group now, come up with some ideas of what good questions would be, and then continue to think about them for a week and think about, can I write this a little bit better? And if you can, it, it's going to save you time uh, in the long run. So make sure you're getting that ready to go. I'll bring it up again on Wednesday, but you have to remember to get it done. Um, Yep, so we'll move forward with that. Make sure you're working on chapter two and then you should be starting chapter three and starting to work through that material. Um, uh, let's see, other stuff. So you know when the final, you know when the project's gonna be due, which doesn't really matter. It's during, um, it's during finals week. Um, I mean, unless you're waiting till the last minute, then I guess it matters. But most of you, if you're staying on top of it, a large portion of the work for your project will be done as we move through the semester. So as long as you're doing that work in these, you know, these project discussions, huge amount of your work will be done. Plus it's helpful when you go in there and you see what other people are doing. Sometimes you're like, I'm kind of confused on this part. And then you see what other people are doing and you're like, oh, okay, I kind of get it. I think I understand what's going on, right? Don't just rely on what other people's work, but you can use it as a reflection like, does my work look good compared to theirs or does theirs look better than mine? Maybe I can, maybe I can improve my work a little bit um, along the way. So, so do that. And then, um, so let's see, I know Donovan had a question for me, which is great. Anybody else who wants to talk to me, I will now stay in Zoom and help people for as long as I can. And, uh, you know, I have eventually office hours actually at noon today as well. So I'll help you right now after class. But if you can't meet with me right now, come back at noon and I can help you during office hours and we can sort of uh, go from there. OK, thanks, everybody. And I will see you in a couple days. All right. Great.